Hey, welcome back. And as you see, this is my official Japanese name, Samori. <laughs> and Shirutane. <laughs> so yesterday, some of you asked about how to choose the regularization parameter. This is, of course, a deep question, very important question. So I prepared some slides uh, for this one, so I adapted to your question. Uh, I hope the slides uh, don't have too many mistakes. Let's see what happens. Anyway, so in an inverse problem, this is kind of a general view of an inverse problem. Um, we have a model space X where our unknown object is a member, so, so F here. We have the forward map, which now in the linear part of the course, this will be just a matrix or linear operator. This is the data space. Well, in the linear case, this is just Rn and this is just Rk, finite dimensional linear. But uh, in the second part of the course, we will have more complicated nonlinear situation with electrical impedance tomography. But this is anyway the general picture that can cover uh, many inverse problems in, in general. And now, often, we also specify some domain for the forward map. It may be the whole space, like in a linear case, we can, we can think it's the whole space. And then there's also the range of the forward map, which I drew uh, in, in, in this form. It may be really a proper subset of the data space. So then we have our measurement model, uh, M equals AF plus noise. And in this picture it means that the perfect data, AF, so if we have our true object here, which we want to know, this F, the ideal perfect data, the infinite, oh, do I need a microphone? I forgot about the microphone. Is it Yeah, uh, microphone. Yes, just realized. Every day the same problem. Sorry. problem, so we have the infinite precision data AF, the perfect data, but in practical situations we don't have it. What we have is M that has also this noise component, which is usually unknown. Also, in practice it's often random. Uh, for example, if you take a photo in a very dark uh, cafeteria, for example, you know that your photo will be noisy because there are not so many photons coming to your sensor and then there is statistical noise. But if you take the same picture two times, the noisy picture will not be exactly the same. The noise will have another random realization. So epsilon may be really complicated, actually. So anyway, M is given to us and we would like to know F, approximately maybe. So this is a, also the general view of regularization of inverse problems. Because often, uh, often the forward map uh, is unstable uh, in, in ill-posed inverse problems, meaning that it does not have a continuous inverse, even when restricted to its range. Its range. Now in the finite dimensional case, like we saw the singular value decomposition, uh, uh, precise, in, in precise mathematical terms, we will have some singular values being exactly zero, uh, which is the kernel of the matrix, and then we will have a bijection between uh, the range of the matrix and, and some, uh, some part of the domain. Uh, and strictly speaking, mathematically, of course, there is a continuous inverse from the range 
back here. But like we saw yesterday, it's very unstable. And if we go to the infinite dimensional case, for example, if these are Hilbert spaces uh, with countably uh, infinite bases, then we can have that the limit of strictly positive singular values tend to zero. So that's, that's really such a case when there is no continuous inverse, uh, even when we restrict uh, to the range. So what needs to be done, or what's usually done in inverse problems, we construct a family of mappings, which is called a regularization strategy. So we describe uh, continuous functions, gamma alpha, defined on the whole data space Y, and mapping into the model space X. And then uh, we take, we assume that we know the noise level, that we know that our M is at most delta away from the perfect measurement. So it's in this disk. And usually the idea is to define these maps. So these have to be continuous maps, not necessarily linear, they can be nonlinear, but they have to be continuous maps. Uh, and we have to, it has to specify some specific requirements at the zero noise limit when the delta, delta becomes small. Let me be more precise. These are the official requirements for a regularization strategy. So first of all, for the perfect data, the infinite precision data, uh, if we take uh, a fixed point uh, in the data space or in the domain of forward map, and we take the perfect data of it and apply the regularization to it, then when the regularization parameter goes to zero, this also should go to zero in the topology of the model space. Then, the more complicated case, when there is noise, and about the noise, we only know that it's smaller than epsilon. Okay, now I have a notation, notation problem. This, this should be delta, delta here. Sorry, this should be the size of the noise. So, we should specify how to choose alpha as a function of this should be delta. So as as the as the function of this uh, radius we know here, in such a way that alpha goes to zero when the noise level goes to zero, and then we have to have this one. A bit complicated, but actually what it says is that the worst case error must vanish when the noise level goes to zero. So this supremum is taken over all the data in the disk of radius, this should be delta. And this is the difference, this is the regularized reconstruction we get with uh, uh, a specific choice of alpha. So this reconstruction error should at most, taking supremum over all the disk, should go to zero. This is what we aim for in inverse problems, to prove that some approach uh, satisfies such conditions. From the practical point of view, uh, this is already very nice to have, but of course there is still the problem that when we have practical data there is some noise, it has some size, and the size is not going to zero. I mean there is some finite size and uh, with such an asymptotic result maybe still it's not enough to know for a given noise how good reconstruction we get. But anyway, this is, this is something we aim for in the mathematics of inverse problems. And if we have such strategy, usually it works nicely also in practice because of this asymptotic good behavior. Okay, so that was kind of what we tried to do. So we should, <coughs> when we describe the choice of the regularization parameter, if we do it really properly, those uh, conditions should be satisfied. So then, uh, let's talk about the classical Tihonov regularization. So recall that uh, in our finite dimensional case, this is what we look for. We try to find the vector in Rn that would minimize this 
functional that has two terms. The first one measuring the data discrepancy and the second one expressing some a priori information about our unknown. And how to choose alpha there? Well, there are many, many studies about this question in the inverse problems literature. Um, maybe these ones are the most well known. Let me describe the L curve method. It's a little bit heuristic. I know there is some analysis for it, but I'm not completely sure how rigorous it is. But there, the idea is to choose many regularization parameters from small to large, then make a plot in the in a two-dimensional uh, make a two-dimensional uh, space where the y-axis I think is the logarithm of this one computed for the reconstruction with a certain alpha and the other axis is for this term uh, computed with a certain alpha and then the hope is the idea is that so if here is f and here is So then uh, we're supposed to have some curve like this where, let me think uh, here, alpha, I think here alpha is small because then this one can become large and I think here alpha is big. And then the idea is to hope that this curve has such a shape that there is so it, it would resemble the letter L somehow that's that's the L curve the thing is that sometimes it works and there is such a point and you can even maybe choose it with some curvature uh, condition but the thing is that sometimes it's not at all like this sometimes you can't really find it I may be wrong but I think there is there is not really a proper a theoretical understanding about when it works and when not. And in practice, sometimes it may work, but not always. Cross validation, uh, there the idea is to, uh, when we have a data set, maybe the measurements from different directions or, or, or otherwise a set of measurements, we take a couple of measurements and, and leave them out. And we, we regularize using the first part of the measurements. And when we get the reconstruction, we measure the couple of measurements we took aside. We, make, we simulate those measurements to the reconstruction, and we check if the result is close to the actual measurement. And then we try to find the parameter that minimizes this one. Also, it sometimes works, but um, not maybe always. The models of discrepancy principle, this one I, I will show you in more detail. But before that, I would like to really say that there, there is a lot of other literature, so there are many other methods, and many of them have been proven in the official way I just showed. It, it's quite a big field of its own. Uh, I'm not really an expert in that direction, so uh, I can't really very deeply speak about that, but I know there is a lot of results existing. But this is maybe the most classical and often, often talked about uh, method. So let me give you some understanding how that works. Uh, with this approach, the idea is that since we assume that we know the noise level, we assume that we know the maximum size for the noise, or actually that we know the size of the noise really, that we know this delta. Uh, it depends on the application if this is uh, uh, a useful assumption or not. But if, if we know it, sometimes we can know it by calibration of our measurement device, um, then the idea is that we shouldn't try anything under the noise level. I mean, we should aim, aim for uh, a reconstruction whose data discrepancy is maybe even equal to delta. It doesn't have to be smaller because it, there is no sense. The noise uh, makes it that we don't have any information uh, smaller than the size of the noise. 
there's also a little caveat that we will also see in the numerical example I, I will show, show. It's very often the case that noise is random. So then, for example, if we think of white noise, that we have a noise vector, random vector that takes values in Rk. For example, the very simple case that each component of that vector is uh, independently, identically distributed according to the Gaussian bell curve. Zero center, standard deviation sigma. The thing is that, you know, there's the bell curve, so there is some positive probability even for very large components in absolute value. Their probability is very small, but however, there's positive probability for really large ones. So you don't really know, you don't really know what delta is, is equal to. You could, for example, take the expectation of, of uh, the norm of epsilon, which we can compute, but uh, it's not really equal to the norm, it's the expectation. So sometimes it, it, this may cause some trouble. But mathematically speaking, the theorem, I will give a theorem which holds if we know delta. But this is just a point that in, in practical situations it's sometimes difficult to know that. Okay, so uh, the aim of the Morozov method is to choose such an alpha that really the size of the data discrepancy equals delta. And the related theorem says that this is possible if delta satisfies such an inequality. So here is the uh, norm of our measurement. Here is the norm of uh, the part of the measurement if we project it to the co-kernel of the matrix A. The delta should be between. Now, the, you know, if, if delta is different, also M is different because M contains noise that has size delta. So it's not always the case that this code is really needs to hold, and it, it's not always the case. But the theorem says, if this is true, then uh, we can uniquely, there is just one, one choice for alpha that gives this identity. That's the method then. Let me show you the proof, and, and the proof will directly lead to a method how to do this uh, in practice. So. Remember uh, the singular value decomposition. Uh, A can be written with two square matrices U and V and diagonal matrix D, which has the same size than A, not necessarily square. These guys are both orthonormal, very nicely behaving, just orthonormal transformations of space. And then also recall that the Tihon of regularization can be written in this way, that we take this u and v in the opposite order, so v first and then u transpose, between is something I call d beautiful plus alpha, uh, which is this diagonal matrix. It has these guys here, and it doesn't matter if some of the singular values start to be zero after the index r, this is still okay. So this is a nice way of writing the Tihon of regularization. We will use this, this uh, formula. So we need to make computations about this norm here. That's A times our Tihon of regularized reconstruction, gamma alpha M. So let's compute a little bit what this is. So A we can write with the singular value decomposition, uh, gamma alpha M we can write in the form we just saw, so this one. So then V transpose V will cancel, it's just identity. Uh, UD will stay here, and M prime, I denote by M prime this guy, U transpose times M. I just give it another name. So then we can start computing. So first of all, we see that um, we can take the, we can 
here we can put u times u transpose and take u out of the norm because it's also orthogonal transformation, it doesn't change the norm. So we get only this one, but this is already very simple because this uh, d times d plus alpha, uh, then we can just very easily uh, compute a little bit and, and we see that uh, r, remember that r was the index of the last strictly positive singular value. So we have here a different expression for all the strictly positive singular values and just the square uh, squared sum of the remaining elements of M prime. Such a formula. And already from this one we can see that uh, the mapping from the parameter alpha to this guy, so actually so this guy, this doesn't depend on alpha anymore, so mapping alpha to this guy is monotonically increasing. So then, and what we are trying to do, we want this guy, let me go back, uh, so we want this one to be equal delta, that's what we are aiming for. So now what we already can do, we can see that uh, it's a monotonically increasing function, so that makes the value unique. If it ever hits that desired value, there is only one alpha that gives it. So then, um, formally, if we take alpha to zero, let me go back uh, here. So if we take alpha to zero, then we just have uh, Why do we need this formal identity? Mm. Well, this just becomes zero then. Yes. Yes. So then we just we are left with only these guys. And on the other hand, if we let alpha go to infinity, then what happens uh, is we just get one here in the limit. So we have on the left side, uh, so this is the guy we are analyzing. On the left we have a lower bound, which has only the remaining uh, elements here in the sum. And on the right hand side we have upper bound that has the norm of M prime squared. And this is what we wanted to show. So the second one is already clear from here because of uh, the orthogonal transformation. So the norm of this one is the same than norm of M prime. But this one we still have to show, the lower bound. So here, this P projection, the idea was that it's the orthogonal projection uh, to the co-kernel of A. So it's this part when we look at how A is mapping from Rn to Rk. And now, um, when we think of this, this uh, U transpose on, on RK, what does it do? It actually just organizes the RK space. It, it rotates it in such a way that, that the singular values of A, they are just numbered, like first singular value for this dimension, second for this dimension, and so on, up to dimension R. And then the remaining are here. So for the diagonal matrix D to operate, uh, you tau just actually orders these dimensions in that convenient way. So actually, uh, in M prime, it's, it's really M prime is in the space where the dimensions are numbered from 1, 2, 3, 4, up to R, and then from R plus 1 uh, up to K. So actually, this orthogonal projection can be done so that first we map M with the U transpose, to this one, what we already called M prime. And then we take the projection, so the first R components, they correspond to these guys in the picture, and we put them to zero. So that's, that's what it is to take an orthogonal uh, projection 
to this part of the space, which is the co-kernel. So that's why actually what we have there on the left-hand side is, is really this guy. So this is the proof for the models of uh, theorem. And then, numerically, what we have to find is we, we write down this function of alpha that appeared in the proof. Uh, and here we put this desired delta. We would like this guy here to be equal to delta square. So we can plot this guy in the computer and see where is it zero, which is the alpha value that gives a zero to this guy. If there is a zero, then we take the alpha that gives that. And if there is no zero, if, if it doesn't cross zero, then the assumptions are violated and we just can't use it. So let me show how this works on yesterday's example we considered. <clears throat> so let me just run this first. So here you see uh, a reconstruction I computed. And now automatically, using the models of principle, we got a picture like this. And what happened in the, in the computation Let me actually let me actually plot this uh, <laughs> okay so now we see that uh, Zero is here, so we can we can take the alpha value that corresponds to zero. That's what happened in the code. So let's let's take a closer look. What was there? Uh, what is there in this piece of code? So first I start with just a few, so the green ones are just comments. They are not really the code. So first I just choose what size we are dealing with. So I choose this uh, 32 by 32 matrix. So two to the power of five is 32. So then, and I choose also this number of angles 33. We have two choices, pre-computed 33 directions or, and 17 directions. And then, uh, I make a couple of loading commands of previously computed stuff. So this is from the Radon matrix that computed uh, the matrix A for our use. And from there I will take a few, few things. The matrix A itself, uh, these ones were, well we all already know, but also I have pre-computed the uh, SVD. That actually takes a long time for big matrices. So that's why I just computed them and saved them for later use. And then the other loading command is uh, from this file that computed uh, the simulated data that tried to avoid inverse crime. So simulated with a little bit different grid. And from there, the important, important thing is, on the other hand, this one, which says uh, M for measurement, NC for no crime, and the N in the end means noisy, because I just added simulated noise. And actually, this one is the standard deviation of the Gaussian uh, random variables I added there, and in addition, I computed the subnorm of the noise, because in the simulation case, we, we can access everything. The, the perfect uh, phantom and the data and the noise and everything so we can analyze what happens. So I have two measurements for the size of the noise. So then, first of all, I will, I will take uh, the diagonal values in the matrix D. So after this command, I will have a vector escort s for singular, singular values. 
So I just pick out the diagonal from D, and then uh, I want to decide how many of them are non-zero. In mathematics, of course, something is zero or it is not zero. In computational realism, on the other hand, uh, in floating point number arithmetic, we have to decide what is close enough to zero to be zero. So in this case, I choose that 10 to the minus 10 is already so small that anything smaller than that I consider a perfect zero. So that's how I decide how many singular values are non-zero. That gives us the R. So then this is the M prime written in Finnish uh, from my old course. Bilku means a prime in Finnish. Sorry about that. So M prime is this one, uh, U transpose times our noisy data. And then uh, I compute the size of the projection of the data to the co-kernel of A. So these are the components from, from index R plus 1 until the end. So I compute the norm of that one, which is the lower bound in the theorem. And this is the, the upper bound. And now. Uh, the noise level should be in between. So, oh, I call it kappa, apparently. So here, uh, I, I'm using, so we could use either way, we could use, this would be really the, uh, the way to use the, the uh, expected value of, of the norm of the noise. So then I just uh, just display these three numbers so we can observe if they are in the right order. And this will give an error if, if, if not. And then actually at this point I had to kind of manually look where to plot this function to see where it has a zero. But anyway, uh, so here uh, we had this, let's see, we had this uh, so we had this function. So this part of the function with these sums, uh, is this one. First there, oh, this is the first part up to, from R, 1 to R, and then this is the remaining part. Here I compute the norm squared by inner product of, two ve of the vector with itself. And this is, uh, it should be called delta, but yeah, that, that's the guy. So that's our function. And then, uh, then I plot the function for us to see. And if there is, I mean, this is also an error. Error, if, if it doesn't cross the zero line, then we can't continue anymore. But if we can, then uh, then uh, we can just, uh, well, here, delta is actually, in this row, delta is actually picking out the value for regularization parameter that really uh, produces the zero for that function. And then here I'm using t of regularization. You see, well, so this is what I showed you, the, the one way of implementing t of regularization, we had the V matrix, then we have this uh, D, D matrix with, the, with, with these guys uh, at the diagonal, and then U transpose and noisy data. So this was the one way to compute the t of regularized solution. And finally, I have to because these, these works work in, in vectors, but our final thing, we, have, we want it to be an image. So I reshape uh, the vector coming out of this one. I reshape it into uh, 32 by 32 size uh, to show. So this is what goes on here. And now we can observe, I think, already here when I, you see, I made one change. I actually you see, instead of the maximum noise level, I use the expected value for the norm, and immediately uh, our approach already failed. Uh, we see the lower bound in the theorem, 
then the thing that should be in between, and this is the upper bound. So it wasn't there, so uh, we can't use it. On the other hand, for the maximum <laughs> measurement for that one, it did work. But I think even there, if I return to the max thing, mm, I think there, even if, I, if you compute the data, so this is the noise level, so if instead of 1% noise, let's say we put 10% noise. So now we have... <coughs> more noise so now it didn't work even what worked before for one percent noise with the noise level max measurement of the noise now it didn't work now this is too big so you see this is this is uh, the relationship between uh, theorems concerning the parameter choice rule and practice. And this is even not really practice practice because I'm, I'm just simulating the data. When it's measured data, everything is even more difficult. So just to give you an idea that um, sometimes uh, uh, when we have theorems, sometimes they are extremely useful and sometimes they work like this, they either work or not, and it's kind of unclear. And this is why I think there needs to be many methods for parameter choice, because for a given application, some method may work and some other one will not work. Okay. Any questions about the Morozov approach? If not, let's then move on to the total variation case. So for total variation regularization, uh, we recently proposed a method that's based on, on making use of different resolutions of the computational grids. That one is what I want to uh, explain to you. And First of all, let me introduce to you one of our other data sets we did with a walnut. So you see here is a, a walnut in an x-ray machine, and here are a couple of images, x-ray images of the walnut. We took actually 1,200 images, so very small rotations, and we took an image. So actually, if we apply filtered back projection to the whole 1,200 projections, we get this extremely beautiful image. So this is really done with those singular integral methods I, I discussed. So this is, this is the beautiful mathematics of the Radon transform. It works when we have fine enough uh, discretization of the angular integral that's involved. And then it's really spectacular how, how much detail we see. But then, uh, like I told you yesterday, sometimes for practical considerations or other reasons, we only have uh, less data. So for example, here we have only 20 directions. If we use filtered back projection, uh, the quality of the picture goes down quite a lot. But it's really not at all designed for this kind of data, of course. Total variation is a much better approach uh, for this one. And now since this lecture is now about the parameter choice rules. Let me give you a little litera literature review. Uh, I think this is pretty much up to date because in our uh, new paper I'm, I'm explaining next, we had uh, four referees who, every one of them had extremely good comments and also very strict. And there were a more computational referee and very theoretical referee and a couple of ones between. So. We had a really proper refereeing process for the paper, including a very careful study of, of what has been published about total variation parameter choice methods. So I think this is quite a complete list, probably. And 
again, some of these have deeper theoretical analysis. Some of them, like this one, are more on a heuristic level. Um, ours, what I want to next describe, I think is somehow between heuristic and, and rigorous, in a sense, I will, I will make precise. Namely, I mean, we have a theorem that gives understanding of the phenomenon, but how we use uh, this method is not completely, uh, completely connected with the theorem in, in a bit strange way. Let me show. Okay, so the basic idea here is to, again, like I told you, when we have a situation where we have some object uh, inside the measurement domain, and then we put the X-ray source in different positions with always the detector on the opposite side. Uh, for the computational inversion, we need to build a simulation model for the measurement. And for the simulation model, we divide the computational area into pixels, and we can choose the number of pixels as we like. And like I told you, I, I all, many times at this point, there is a question or criticism, why on earth would you ever take a smaller pixel here than the pixel in the detector? This is a perfectly good question. And I would say that the reason here is that we would like to bring to inverse problems a similar convergence analysis, which is standard in, for example, finite element method. You know, in, in FEM, uh, you have, a, let's say, an elliptic equation, and you have a, a continuous theory in, in subordinate spaces, like an H1 uh, solution in the, in the domain, for example, a Dirichlet value. And then in finite elements, uh, you discretize the area by using triangles. And then there is a theorem saying that when you work in this uh, finite dimensional subspace of H1 spanned by these, let's say, piecewise linear functions uh, on the triangles, when you make the triangle size smaller and smaller, then your numerical result is closer and closer to the true solution. So here the thinking is a little bit similar. We would like to have a convergence of our solution, although it's a bit, bit more complicated than in the case of finite elements. Okay, let me also make a comment that uh, in this technique I'm showing, it seems to be crucial to use this so-called anisotropic total variation, where we have the two components of the gradient, uh, or the length of the gradient in the L1 style. So two components, an L1 norm, and just summed. And for practical pixel images, how we do it is we are just using the sums of, of horizontal neighbor pixels and vertical neighbor pixels. So computationally very simple. But now that we use these different grids, there appears this very important uh, 1 over n. If you work with, with images of size n by n, where does this come from? From a very simple computation, namely when we take such a derivative, an absolute value, if we approximate the derivative, by, by the, uh, this usual difference quotient, there appears uh, the size of the step in the grid, 1 over n here. And then when we approximate the integral as a sum uh, over the pixel, so this is the pixel area here, so this 1 over n cancels one of the guys here. And of course, if we are in 3D, there will be 3 here and 2 here. And in 1D, I mean, there will be nothing. I'm saying this because every single person who ever implemented this approach first made a mistake of forgetting this one and got strange results, including me. So uh, <laughs> it's good to remember. So here the idea is that um, let's let's say what we saw already before yesterday is that if we have two small parameter. The noise will, will be, there will be a lot of noise in the reconstruction. Then somehow if the parameter is good, we have a nice kind of piecewise homogeneous solution with the shortest possible curves uh, around the areas of constant color. And if we take two big parameter, then this will just tend to a constant image. 
And while going to constant image, there are some intermediate situations with, that look like this. So we would like to find this kind of alpha, that's the goal, but automatically. Uh, so now the basic idea behind this approach is that with the very same data, given data, so the data resolution doesn't change, the data is exactly the same. Like I said, we can reconstruct at different resolutions. We can choose the resolution freely. And now I think, I think it's a reasonable goal to hope that if we continue this process of reconstructing with a finer and finer grid, with the same data, these guys should converge to something, some kind of continuous counterpart. I'm saying it's a bit different with finite elements because in an ill post inverse problem, it's not necessarily a good reconstruction that it's converging to. I mean, if we have a bad alpha, I mean, it, the limit may be completely useless. In finite elements, this is not the case. There is a good solution we are interested in, and then we can compute it more and more carefully. In inverse problems, there is the extra thing that it's not necessarily a good reconstruction, but still, I think it would be important to converge. And now the idea behind this parameter choice is that empirically we saw this kind of thing that if alpha is too small, the noise amplification is getting worse and worse when we go to finer. Whereas it seems that when we have this so-called good or just right alpha, it seems that we are just approximating the same function better and better all the time, which is also the case in this useless situation. Also we are approximating something useless better and better. So this led us to think that, okay, if we choose a lot of values for alpha, so going from small values up to large values, and for each of them we compute let's say three reconstructions, maybe even more of It's a bit too much computation to be really very practical, but I mean, as uh, discussing the idea, let's just compute all of these reconstructions. And the numbers here I'm showing, those are the total variation norms or semi-norms of the reconstructions. We're thinking that, okay, if they converge, then I think the TV norm should be stable when we compute it at any resolution. And well, now it seems that, okay, there is a limit value for alpha, that when alpha is this value or bigger, there is roughly uh, a constant value uh, in the TV norms of the reconstructions. However, when alpha is too small, there seems to start some kind of blow up uh, the noise is more and more amplified with finer resolutions, so it's not really consistent with different resolutions. Then we added some more noise to the data. Uh, small alpha, just right alpha, although previously it was one, now this just right is ten. We need a bit more regularization for more noise. Again, something useless. And now what happens is that, so this is what we saw previously, the low noise case, and now we put more noise, uh, we see that, okay, we have to go a little bit to bigger alpha to, to achieve this, this uh, stability in the norm. So far, so good. It seems to be kind of intuitive and it seems to work nicely. We have done this, I think, for three or more data sets and also including 3D, and it seems to always work. So this was curious to us and we wanted to prove something about it. So the theory part. Theory part, uh, something curious appears in the theory part. Uh, let me also mention that uh, there are several works that use similar techniques to us, but none of them really did this in, from the inverse problems perspective and using kind of a measurement. And that. So there are many studies that are studying convergence, gamma convergence of total variation functionals, uh, so, but they are all a bit different works actually. They, they don't consider the inverse problems perspective. So now uh, we have a theorem, and our theorem holds in two different cases. Uh, this is the more uh, theoretical and the kind of continuum case for the Radon transform that maps from the uh, 
L2 on a, let's say this could be like a rectangle in the plane for example and this is the sinogram space. So actually I think both D, D, both D and omega should be, you can think of them as rectangles uh, in R2. So the image space and the sinogram space. Uh, so A can, for example, be the Rodon transform. And then another case uh, which describes the more practical situation when uh, we have, this is the image space, and then we have a finite number of x-rays going through the material. So this is kind of the more practical case. But both are okay with the theorem. So then uh, we need to consider the BV space norm, functions of component variation. So there, to make it really a norm, we need this L1 part, and then this total variation seminorm part. So L1 part, and this one, for V, we use this anisotropic uh, uh, total variation seminorm. And then we have uh, one functional for the kind of limit case, and several uh, more discrete functionals uh, related to pixelizations of our domain. So here, this S infinity, well here we have a data discrepancy term where the operator A is either one of, of our uh, assumption cases, so for example, Radon transform, and, and U, U here uh, is, is uh, in, in the BV space. So then uh, we also define these SJ functionals. So this is done all in the so-called gamma convergence analysis style, where for we define these SJs for a function, bounded variation function U, so that if U happens to be constant in pixels that are in this 2 to the J by 2 to the J square pixel grid, if it's constant inside these pixels, then uh, we use this one. For a function which is not constant for, for the pixel defined by the index j, then we just define it to be plus infinity. And then we are dealing with the gamma, gamma convergence of these functionals, which is kind of a standard technique, I guess, in this kind of minimization analysis. So we have, in our theorem, we have several statements. So first of all, for each of these uh, pixel-based functionals, there exists at least one minimizer for any pixelization given by J. Also for the limit case, for the infinite case in the, in the space of bounded variation functions, there also is at least one minimizer. And then, if we take any sequence uh, of these guys, there is a subsequence that converges to some limit in, in, the, uh, in this function space. And also, if we compute these seminorms, so recall that V is this one, which is the same thing I computed in those uh, computational uh, tables I showed you, it's that V seminorm. So those V seminorms will also converge to the limit case. And also, this limit here, uh, it's also one of the minimizers for this functional. So, this quite technical theorem, uh, what, what, what it says is that these numbers I showed you in the tables, they all converge. When we refine, uh, when we refine the discretization without limit, they will all converge, which is not what we saw in the numbers, but well, that, that's true, I'm mathematically true anyway. So let me, before begging some uh, more comments, let's take a look at the proof of this theorem. So we had a lot of help actually from uh, mm, let's see I think it's the next page, but okay. So this, is, this lemma is somehow in the core of the whole argument. It's a kind of approximation lemma so that if we have a function in, in a bounded variation space, a U, 
and then epsilon. Then, uh, if we go to fine enough pixelization, then uh, there will be uh, there will be a pixel-based function u prime that is close to u uh, in this relevant sense. So this approximation is is the most important part of the theorem. And oh, what is this? Come on. Point R. So we made a lot of use of the Weber by Bellick and Luskin because they actually proved the same, the, the result we want, but for the triangle based space. But we really need the pixels. I mean, that's what we do. We need the pixel space. So actually, the thing is how to move between a finite triangular, a triangularization and the pixel based space. This is our problem in the lemma. So then, uh, we started, started analysis. It's kind of a geometric argument. So we know that there is only a finite number of, of uh, vertices in this finite uh, triangularization. So for each vertex, we make a neighborhood. So there are these four cases. Either the vertex is exactly in the uh, crossing of, of, or in the corner points of four pixels, or maybe it's between two pixels, um, but the resolution is a bit poor. Sorry, we can't really. But anyway, there, there are four, basically four cases how the vertices can be located either on the corners of pixels or maybe really inside one of the pixels. And there's a finite number of them, so we can go to small enough pixelization to make these neighborhoods small enough for our argument, and then we have to deal with the outsides. And the outside, so uh, these ones have been dealt with. These are small enough for our um, estimation. But then we have to deal with these uh, parts here and take these kind of tubular neighborhoods uh, of these sides of the triangles. And then uh, we take finer and finer pixels, because these have already been dealt with. It doesn't matter if we refine the pixelization. But now we refine the pixelization so much that we can go here inside the tubular neighborhood with a pixel-based curve like this. And then everything reduces to comparing two kinds of functions. This function has constant value here and here divided by a side of a triangle. In our approximation function, we have the same values A and B in these areas, but they are divided by this sawtooth uh, thing with small. And here we use the anisotropic total variation that really had the horizontal and vertical derivatives. Using that argument, we can show that actually uh, the difference between these two functions in the appropriate norm can be actually bounded by just these couple of small parts here. And then we can we can finally close the proof with the epsilon going going close with those. So that kind of geometric argument is in the core of the proof. So then, what I like about this is that it's kind of, it's simple to define. Uh, the implementation is kind of intuitive and nice, and and uh, we don't really like in the model. So we, we needed to know this delta. What is this delta? Here we don't really use such a delta at all. We just use these different resolutions, and, and it seems to give us when the norms or semi-norms are stable, that's the, that's the good alpha. Of course, it's also bad that we have to compute so much. And also, it's kind of strange what happens with, with our, what really is the case with these numbers I showed you. Uh, is it really, I mean, is it so that these will converge only later, that we didn't compute far enough? Or is it so that the actual precise norms of these functions already converge here nicely, or they are, they are stable, but the computation, because it's an ill-thought inverse problem, are, are we unable to compute the actual norms with enough precision? So are these numbers wrong, or is the convergence only later? We don't know yet. 
So it's kind of also a work in progress, but partly proved, partly open, and, and works nicely in practice, that kind of situation. Okay. Any questions about the total variation part? Yeah. Uh, so the total variation, as you define, uh, seems to be not rotational invariant. It's not, yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, are your results sensitive to the direction of computer tomography? So have, do you have any comparison on this aspect? I think, yeah, this will, this will favor the, the two directions. I think I think it, it will give some artifacts and errors in, in that sense, so it, it too easily makes horizontal or vertical lines. I think there will be such an effect. Uh, so if you, you take a picture in deep, uh, slightly mm -hmm. different angle, so you maybe you, you, can, you can get a deep, different yeah, result. I think so. And this is not, not a good, I mean, it would be better. And actually, I think we didn't do really comprehensive studies, but I remember that one of my students tried the same approach with the isotropic, the rotational symmetric definition, and it also seemed to work there, although then the proof doesn't work anymore, so uh, I think this all requires some further study, what is really going on. So why not use the square norm of uh, something? Oh, yes, norm. because that gives smooth reconstructions. Then there are no sharp boundaries at all in the reconstruction. Yes. Uh, and sometimes, or often, for example, in medical imaging, what is important are the boundaries between tissues. That's, that's the really important part. And if you use the, the square norm of the gradient, there, there are no boundaries. Everything is smooth. So going from Tihonov to total variation, the motivation is to have some edges or some, some sharp uh, features in the reconstruction. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's the difference it makes. Other one? Okay. So then there is also another kind. So this is about about sparsity in wavelet spaces. Wavelet bases to kind of look for to use wavelets as building blocks and require that the reconstruction should be done using as few wavelets as possible. We studied this one and also found a, quite a nice method of choosing the parameter. For this case, and this is a joint work with, with, uh, with Tatjana and Zenit there, and also Juho Rimpelainen, who is uh, just finishing his master's thesis in our university. So here um, we are using a soft, uh, soft thresholding approaches that I think in the inverse problems field they were started by this paper, Robeshi, De Vries, uh, and De Mol. They used convex analysis and, and proximal operators to uh, show that the sparse, sparse reconstructions can be computed by such an iteration. So, uh, this is the iterate, or this is the iterate, iteratively uh, constructed reconstruction. So what happens in the iteration is that uh, here we take the simulated measurements of the current iterate, uh, subtract from the measurement. So this is quite a standard part, and also here is the uh, a transpose, which is actually the gradient of the. Um, of the data discrepancy term, pretty much, this here. So there's a gradient step uh, from the previous guide, there's a gradient step, and then the nonlinear part is this thresholding operator. So this is a soft thresholding, so what does it do is it applies this S mu function to all of the wavelet coefficients. This also works with other, for any orthonormal basis. This can be applied. So here are the uh, coefficients in an orthonormal basis. So they will be modified by this nonlinear operator. And what does it do? It makes this so-called uh, soft thresholding that looks like this. So this S mu 
So now if if we if we would use the identity operator, so not, not changing the coefficients at all, so this would this would be the identity function, then uh, of course one could also use so-called hard thresholding. So that uh, if here is mu over two, here is minus mu over two, just to cut here to zero. This would be hard thresholding. But the soft thresholding uh, makes this continuous. It appears as a proximal operator um, from the convex analysis. And here what happens is it takes this one but continues from here. So it's a continuous uh, soft thresholding operation. And well, the wavelengths look like this. So if we divide the walnut into these pieces, so this is, uh, uh, roughly speaking, this is the small vertical details, small diagonal details, small horizontal details, and then we go to two times bigger uh, features. And we can, we can repeat this one many times, and in the end, in the corner, is the low pass part. So this can be actually continued if the image size is a power of two, this can be continued up to just one pixel even. So this is kind of the practical discrete wavelet transform. Digital, digital wavelet transform, yeah. There are some important uh, terms related to uh, the transforms. And here it looks something like this. So this is the fielded back projection. With the bezel, uh, we get something like this. So I call this this bezel because actually uh, the norm of this bezel of one 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 space can be written as just the sum of the absolute values of wavelet coefficients. It also depends on, on the dimensions, so the dimension will appear. But in dimension two, it's very simple. The B one 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 space norm is just the sum of absolute values of wavelet coefficients. Very convenient, actually, and. Let me also comment that, so uh, we are interested in this VE111 space because we previously saw that the total variation is, is a very useful technique, and that's based on the one norm of the first derivative. So also in the Biesov space, there is weak derivative, weak derivative one is here, similar to Sobolev spaces, and there's also L1 norm. Then there's another, uh, there's P and Q, which the other one is some kind of detail exponent, but they're all one, so it's kind of related to total variation. It's not the same, but related, and we can easily compute its norm uh, in, in the wavelet basis. So here, now let's go to this uh, choice of regularization parameter. That's today's theme. So in our team, we, we came up with this idea that because when you choose this threshold in, in, the, in the method, so if you look at this method, this is the iteration, very simple iteration with, with this function, but then the question is, what is mu? How do we choose this, this mu here? So if we take just some value for mu, some constant value, not depending on the iterations, so now if we take uh, a very small value for mu, then it's not really thresholding anything, and almost all the wavelet coefficients remain. So sparsity here, <coughs> I'm measuring from 0 to 1, what is the proportion of non-zero wavelet coefficients remaining? So if we take a very low threshold, almost all of the wavelet coefficients will be used in the reconstruction. So it's not not very sparse, actually. Then if we take a big threshold, then what happens, it forces almost all wavelet coefficients to zero. So you see, this is, it is very sparse, but also maybe not optimal. So then we decided to uh, let the threshold depend on the iteration j. And we think that, uh, because in every 
parameter choice method, we need some kind of a priori information. Like with the motosome, we needed uh, the, uh, the delta, the noise size. With the total variation, thing, uh, the a priori information is that the unknown object is piecewise constant. Here we think that maybe the a priori information is that maybe we know this number. We, we, we know the desired sparsity. What is the percentage of wavelet coefficients that should be there? For example, we may have uh, a database of, of pictures of different walnuts, and we can compute their sparsity, and we know the number, and when we have a new walnut and we want to reconstruct, we just use the sparsity we know a priori. Of course, the same would go for uh, patients in a hospital. If there is a big library of previous CT scans, we can use them. So now the idea is to use the very basic approach from control theory. Control theory, of course, is it's based on observing some, uh, some uh, number that depends on another number and then controlling uh, the output. So now we think that we know the desired sparsity level, which we want to find. And then um, this is done with, with the controlling method. So in each iteration, we compute how far is the sparsity of the current iterate from the desired a priori known sparsity. So this is the error in the control. Then we choose the new threshold depending on the iteration by taking it to be non-negative and, well, so maximum between zero and, and this guy. The beta has to be still chosen, but that's quite easy to choose. I mean, if beta is too big, then uh, there will, the, the method will start to oscillate badly. So then we have to, we can reduce beta even on the run. So it's not a big problem of choosing the beta step. And then uh, we put this threshold uh, to the soft thresholding operator. And also we will implement the uh, non-negativity constraint in the reconstruction. So then what happens is we, we start with some threshold and then uh, non-linearly the method is driving the threshold into such value that the desired sparsity level is found. So here 50%. We can also start with a different, uh, or we, can, we can put a different value here and then it, again it will, it will find the nice value. And also we can start, we can change the, the initial point for the threshold and still it will, it will go to this one. So it seems this is also very new, we did it this year uh, and we believe, uh, here also we had, we had a very uh, observing referee who asked why do you do something so complicated? I mean you could use hard thresholding at every iteration if you know that 30% have, have to be non-zero. Why don't you, in every iteration, take the 30% of the largest ones and just keep them? It's actually a very good suggestion. It, it, it works and it's much simpler. Our defense is that this one will work for many other methods too. I mean, where, where maybe, where something is sparse, for example, like in TV, the gradient of the function is sparse, or, or in, in other bases or other kinds of iterations, where, where the, the, it's not so simple just to threshold. So this, this uh, is much more general approach. We hope will work in many cases. At least it, it seems to work quite nicely in this case. Okay, any questions about the sparsity stuff? But let me let me then let me then move to the nonlinear part of the course and give you some idea of of electrical impedance tomography. Being prepared for reading. Okay. 
this is a new one. But of course, it's good to be prepared. What on earth is this? Thank you. So now let's read the document. Okay, so here let's go to nonlinear tomography where everything becomes a bit more complicated and <laughs> more difficult. Uh, so now we go to PDE-based uh, inverse problems. I divide it into three parts. First, I would, I would just like to tell you a little bit what is EIT, what are the yeah, <coughs> interesting uses for it, and what is the mathematical model behind it, so called Calderon's problem. And then um, <coughs> we will look how T1 of regularization works for this problem, what kind of mathematics and what kind of uh, computational methods uh, are needed for that. And then uh, I will talk about a nonlinear Fourier transform, which is kind of tailor-made for this EIT problem. It's based on complex geometric optic solutions. And there we can actually solve this nonlinear problem directly without an iterative method. So this is an iterative method, but these are non-iterative methods based on really mathematically analyzing the specific nonlinearity there. And finally, at the end of the course, we will see a very new and maybe quite interesting connection to the Radon transform, although this is electric current, uh, diffuse tomography with electric current, so very different, but there is, there is a connection. Okay, so applications, well, what is it, this about? So. One of the basic applications uh, is heart and lungs imaging with, with EIT. There the idea is that some electrodes are attached around the chest of a patient, some currents are fed in through the electrodes, and the resulting voltages are measured. And the aim would be to see what is the electrical conductivity inside the patient, to get, for example, an image that looks like this, there's a heart filled with blood, these are lungs filled with air, and, and to see this image um, moving in real time, that kind of thing. You see this is quite a blurred image, much more blurred than the, than the x-ray images. We will see some reasons for this. Uh, this is a much more difficult imaging method, and such blurring is, is quite a typical, typical thing for, for this approach. Here is some video from my colleague Jennifer Mueller. This is actually measured from a human being, this data. And, and here you see where the heart is going, I mean, heart is beating. This is the face of the heart. And here you can see how blood is moving from uh, the heart to the lungs. And this is really, Jennifer has built her own lab with an EIT machine with all the permissions to be used on humans. Uh, I think this even might be measured from his son, Karsten. He's often been the patient. Because electric currents, they, they have no known harm. It can be left on for, for a while, so it's compared to, for example, x-rays that are known to cause cancer. So this is, this is one good part of this uh, method. Here's a classic image of myself in Rensselaer <laughs> Polytechnic Institute. This was the first study ever where uh, this 4x4 electrode arrangement was tested over the heart. This is John Newell, uh, an electrical engineer at RPI who built the machine and is a guru. This is Jennifer Mueller, and this is uh, Denise who was at the time working there, but I think she's not in science anymore. This is another measurement we did in <coughs> Sao Paulo. We wanted to know if we can, if we can uh, monitor the vocal folds and maybe measure electrically uh, vocal loading or too much using the voice, which would be 
interesting for singers and teachers and for example for all of us to maybe have a dosimeter warning that now it's been too much talking it's 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 a danger to the vocal cords this is also we did the same kind of study in Jennifer's lab with a different different uh, configuration of electrodes <coughs> this is uh, quite an important study from David Isaacson's group so I'm not involved with this one but uh, I want to tell about this important study. They did this in Massachusetts General Hospital, MGH. So they took a, a mammography device, which is an x-ray machine for detecting breast cancer. They put electrodes to both of the plates, top plate and bottom plate, and they used such conductive material that's uh, transparent for x-rays. So it didn't interfere with the, the x-ray image, so they could uh, measure EIT data during the compression of the breast, so then it's easier to register the electrical information with the X-ray information. So then the question is: This is the traditional. Uh, these are traditional mammograms that are used for detecting breast cancer. So uh, can you tell which one has cancer? The one. Yeah, this is. It's difficult. You know, even professional radiologists get it wrong sometimes. There are both false positives, false negatives. It's unfortunately very difficult to see breast cancer. So here, uh, in these three cases, there was a, uh, a biopsy done, so they really know what happened. So this is not cancer. This is, this is just a benign uh, tumor. These two have cancer. And this is one of the potential uses of electrical impedance tomography, because uh, in x-ray images, the cancer is not really so different from healthy tissue. I mean, the x-ray attenuation is pretty much the same. And that's why looking for breast cancer from the x-ray image requires a lot of skill to see little textures and is it pinched somehow? Is it, does it look aggressive in some way? Of course, the radiologists, they develop a good skill for this one, but um, with electrical impedance tomography, it seems that we can get images that don't have very good spatial resolution. These are blurred, but they have a good contrast resolution. The cancer has like four times more, uh, it's more, more, four times more conductive for electricity than healthy tissue. And also here, I think they used some uh, frequency sweep even over some frequency of, of currents. So they would see how the tissue behaves as a function of frequency. So this kind of combination could be much more effective for finding breast cancer. This is one uh, project we have ongoing in Finland. We just got a uh, million euro funding for a project for uh, trying to detect uh, which kind of stroke it is uh, in the brain. So you know, uh, the symptoms of a stroke are such that the person feels bad, cannot speak clearly, when trying to smile, it's, it's only other side of the face is smiling. And also, if the person is asked to lift both hands like this, only when one hand goes up. So then they know that this hand is low, so the problem is on this side of the brain, on the opposite side of the brain. And most typically, it is either bleeding, so this is blood, this white thing here, or there's a blood clot, so that there's not enough blood in this part. Both are very dangerous, and if the patient is not treated within four hours, there will be permanent brain damage. However, if there's a good treatment in like 30 minutes, usually there is complete recovery. So it's really a crucial thing. Also, the symptoms are the same for both. And for this one, you should give a blood thin thinning uh, medication that will dissolve the clots. But if you give blood thin thinning to this one, the patient will die. Also for this one, you should give coagulant that makes the blood stick and prevent bleeding. Also, it's very dangerous for this one. So you should know which one. And currently, the patients are taken to a hospital, to a CT or MRI machine, to know what is it. We would like to see, we would like to have a, a machine like this in the ambulance already, a cheap portable device, 
either using this kind of hat or maybe maybe a helmet like this. This is in, in David Holder's laboratory in U University College London. Uh, to already in the ambulance to see which one it is and start the medication immediately. Also, it's important uh, to monitor the patient in the intensive care unit over several days to see how it is developing. And nowadays, they, they take these very sick patients to the CT, to another floor in the hospital. They move them and take a CT or MRI and bring back. With EIT, this could be there on, on them all the time without harm and give the information. This is uh, a use of EIT for detecting cracks in concrete. So for old bridges and buildings to see if, if they are still okay or, or not. So here you see there's a, this is done in, in uh, University of Eastern Finland. They did such concrete pieces themselves and induced some cracks and then, then measured. This is one of my favorite studies in, in electrical impedance tomography. Uh, the, the Aku Seppänen is from Finland and Mohamed Burglas uh, works uh, in the US. So this is quite nice. They, they wanted to see moisture entering concrete, to see there is more water here and this is dry. So the, this, this one is feeding water and they used EIT to see how the water is going inside. And what I like about this study is they wanted to see, they wanted to have a comparison. What is the truth? to compare to. So in here you have uh, the truth to compare. And how they did this one, they used neutron tomography. So they, they were placed right next to a nuclear reactor that has a very high neutron flux out of the reactor. And of course no person can be inside the chamber. So, so they took these kind of photographs using neutron, neutron detectors. So I think this is, this is a proper heavy science with concrete slabs and neutrons from the nuclear reactor. <laughs> cool. Okay. I think my time is up, so this was just kind of a motivation for tomorrow. That's the kind of imaging we will study. So it has many uses. It's safe, uh, not so expensive, and you can, you can image many kinds of materials. But then, the problem of reconstruction is mathematically very hard. So we will go into more detail then tomorrow. Thank you.